Claire, and Megan, and, and Brett. So beautiful. Music like that lifts our hearts to heaven, doesn't it? I want to talk about something today that is uh, maybe a little bit unusual, but I think as we go along in the message, you'll understand why it's important. When Jesus rose from the dead, his disciples went to the tomb. Of course, Mary was the first to find out that Jesus had been resurrected and the first to be sent. A woman in that culture, Jesus tapped her to take the good news of his resurrection. Uh, scripture tells us what happened. Yeah, we, uh, here we go. Scripture tells us what happened. So Peter and the other disciple, who was John, started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple, John, outran Peter. John's being uh, humble in the way he refers to himself, especially since he won the foot race. So John reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. What we're looking at here in this passage of Scripture is, is a, an evidence for the resurrection of Christ that is not usually mentioned. Did you spot it? It's the folded head cloth. If Jesus' body had been stolen, who would have stopped to fold the head cloth? If the Roman soldiers had come in and taken Jesus away and taken off things, would one of them stop to fold the head cloth? When the disciples saw that folded head cloth, it says they saw and believed. They knew that Jesus, their master, the one they'd been following for all those years, was a person who was neat and orderly in every aspect of his life. They knew that Jesus was resurrected and that he had stopped and folded the cloth that was around his head. In Desire of Ages said it was Christ himself who had placed those grave clothes where they, where they were with such care. When the mighty angel came down to the tomb, he was joined by another who, with his company, had been keeping guard over the Lord's body. As the angel from heaven rolled away the stone, the other entered the tomb and unbound the wrappings from the body of Jesus. But it was the Savior's hand that folded each and laid it in its place. In his sight, who guides alike the star and the atom, there is nothing unimportant. When Jesus rose from the dead, he had work to do. He had grieving disciples to go and comfort. He had to ascend back to the Father in heaven to make sure his sacrifice had been accepted. Uh, he had to get ready to teach his disciples for 40 days before he went back to heaven for the final time. Jesus had a lot to do. But he stopped to fold his grave clothes. Now I think every, <clears throat> every parent who is sitting here right now probably has their elbow right in the side of their child. <laughs> and they say, you hear that, you hear that? Fold your clothes. Remember to be neat. And that's certainly a lesson that we can learn from Jesus. Jesus lived a very ordered life 
because he depended on his father for daily strength and direction. Now, I know people who struggle with organization. I was one. One of my family members who lives some distance from here had a serious case of ADD growing up, attention deficit dis disorder. Are you familiar with that? People who have ADD have a hard time organizing anything. They can't organize their stuff. They can't organize their day. Their closets usually are on the floor because it takes too much effort to hang them up neatly. Now, there are people who don't have ADD who have the same problem, right? But people with ADD struggle with that. There are other kinds of learning disorders, deficits, that make it difficult to be organized. Now, because I know this relative who struggled with this and didn't discover what it actually was until she was in graduate school and then got help so that she could manage graduate school. And then, of course, daddy, parentheses, daddy was regretting and feeling very guilty about all those speeches that I gave when she was a young girl about never succeeding if she wouldn't learn to organize herself. Now I knew. But I knew something else. I realized that I probably had that when I was a child too. Because I had a terrible time being organized. I registered for classes in high school that I forgot to go to. Now, who does that? Um, and so I'm speaking today as one who has struggled with organization, and God has helped me and taught me a lot. You, you might look at Pastor Brownfield and say, you struggle with organization? You seem organized. One of the things that has helped me is something that Ellen White wrote in Steps to Christ. Consecrate yourself in the morning. Make this your very first work. Let your prayer be, take me, O Lord, as wholly yours. I lay all my plans at your feet. Use me today in your service. Abide with me. Let all my work be accomplished in you. This is a daily matter. Each morning, give yourself to God for that day. Surrender all your plans to Him to be carried out or given up as His providence shall indicate. Thus, day by day, you may be giving your life into the hands of God, and thus your life will be molded more and more after the life of Christ. You know how many times I've prayed that prayer? Because when I wake up in the morning, I have so much to do. I have lists on paper, lists on my iPhone, and I depend on God to get me through that day and do what's most important. So many times my dates are different than I even planned. Because, partly because I believe God is guiding and partly because there are needs that I don't expect will arise uh, at the beginning of the day. In Desire of Ages it says this, So utterly was Christ emptied of self that he made no plans for himself, he accepted God's plans for him, and day by day the Father unfolded his plans. So we should depend on God that our lives may be the simple outworking of his will. You know, I think looking at Jesus' life, we would say, that was an organized life. His life was a life that accomplished great things. Amazing. As you study it in detail and, and realize how he went here and went there, you see a divine organization. It's because Jesus trusted God to plan for him and to organize for him. Now that, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't plan. That, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't uh, get up in the morning and make our list. But it means that we should depend on God for his leadership in our lives. And if we do... He will guide us. If we have interruptions in our life that we don't expect, we can see them as divine interruptions, not as inconveniences or annoyances. You understand? Pastors have to learn that lesson early, otherwise we spend all of our time frustrated. Why is that person coming to see me? 
see, now I had all this plan today. No, God probably is sending this person, and I need to um, treat that person as a divine opportunity of interruption. So, organization, thank you, Kiana. Orderliness are important things. Most people in organizations realize that. A person who is orderly, self-disciplined, purposeful, respectful of authority and manners, and is well-groomed, often has other good traits, and succeeds in life where others might fail. There's probably a connection between these traits and good mental health. Would you agree? That if we can tend to stay organized and tend to have uh, good plans in our lives, we tend to have greater emotional well-being. Of course, parents and teachers work with their children to establish habits of order and organization, knowing that success in life, and indeed success in their studies, depend on acquiring those states. Right, teachers? Right? Those traits. Sometimes there are rewards for good behavior and discipline when there isn't. Our teachers are getting their classrooms ready now. At least in our schools. Public schools already started. Um, one of our teachers posted a picture of her, of her classroom on Facebook. It was attractive, beautiful, organized. School hadn't started yet. You, you get the joke? <laughs> there were no students, no children. But knowing this teacher, it will continue to be that way. But teachers have to deal with this, struggle with this all the time. Stay organized, stay on top of everything. And I know that our teachers depend on God. When I was a child and a, a young person, my dad had different ways of teaching self-discipline. He would come into our bedrooms in the morning and sing army songs. We hated it. We hated it. I, I won't regale you at the moment. But he would also quote scripture. <coughs> scripture is like, well, I have to tell you this first. My wife and I both grew up in homes of veterans. They both had learned self-discipline in the army. And so we're the, the grateful beneficiaries of army people. Was it Marines? Your dad? Army. Okay. Yeah, and in Debbie's family, uh, Sundays they had to pick dandelions before they could play. Now this, this, this was not my wife's house. Nor did their yard look like that. It was clean of dandelions because every every Sunday they had to pick in before they could do their work. Well, Dad would. Uh, Oh, I got ahead of myself, did I? Okay. Well, I don't see the, the verse. Here, here are the verses that he would quote very enthusiastically when I was still trying to sleep. Go to the ant, thou sluggard. <laughs> Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer, no ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. Other times he would say, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a bandit, and scarcity like an armed man. Now, is it any wonder that uh, Pastor Brown put his gameplay in point? <laughs> Um, we all seem to learn the lesson. We, we, all, we all succeeded in life. Uh, we moaned and groaned, but Dad's words and example never left us. Dad learned what he taught. He'd be up early in the morning, 5 o'clock every morning. Something he learned from delivering newspapers as a kid through the snowy streets of Denver, Colorado. And then later in the Army, 
uh, when he was a medical cadet corpsman and then managed a medical supply depot. Well, organization. I want to talk today about three important areas of order in our lives. Physical order and cleanliness. I want to begin by thanking those of you in the church who devote significant time to keeping our physical plan repaired and looking good. Did you know that there are people like our head deacon and his team that work around him that actually spend countless hours here at the church keeping things clean? Of course, yes, we, we hire a custodian. They come in one day a week for just a few hours. But there's a lot that is done. And I, I want to mention Joyce Garrett too. I don't think Joyce is here today. Joyce is often here cleaning up. She comes in and cleans up the kitchen. She she, uh, she brings academy students in and cleans the pews and cleans the windows. And she just does it because it needs to be done. Our deacons, especially our head deacon, carry the biggest share of this responsibility. But uh, I want to encourage those of you who are younger to begin to think about what you could do to help keep up God's house. You know, we, we just maybe kind of take it for granted that Andy Joyce and Uncle Carl and uh, others, but they're going to do this. We come on Saturday morning. We may not even realize all the busy bees that are here during the week. Um, God wants everything connected with his church to be clean and orderly and neat and in good repair. We should strive for excellence because that is God's character and it honors him. While we have our homes and our work sites to keep up with, church should also be high on our priority list. It is God's house and it should be kept in the best repair and looking good to bring glory to God for those who attend and to the neighbors who look at our church and judge our religion by, by how our church looks. I want to thank all of you who came out to the last couple of work days and did so much to repair God's house and to make it better. You know, we might spend thousands of dollars on our home or on our clothes or on personal appearances, but friends, God's house deserves the best. Wouldn't you agree? Not that we want to idolize God's house, but it deserves the best. Deserves the best. There's a story I remember from childhood, which I read to my children. There was a wicked queen by the name of King Queen Athaliah. She had killed off the royal family, and she had an evil reign over the nation of Judah. There was one boy, however, the son of the king who had died, named Joash. He was hidden by a nurse and by the priests. And when he got to be seven years old, they brought him out and crowned him king and ended the evil reign of Queen Athaliah. And she was executed. Joash began his reign under the tutelage of Jehoiada, the high priest. When he was seven years old, Joash said to the priest, that, by, the way, by the way, the temple had fallen into disrepair. You could go into rooms and everything was just kind of jumbled up in there. You could see places where the termites had eaten everything out or dry rot. Things had fallen down. It was a mess. And so Joash uh, said to the priest, collect all the money that has brought us sacred offerings to the temple of the Lord. Yeah, the money collected in the census, money received from personal vows, and money brought voluntarily to the temple. And let every priest receive the money from one of the treasures, and let it be used to repair whatever damage is found in the temple. Good plan. 
Not a bad plan for a seven-year-old, although probably Uncle Jehoido was giving him some advice. Let me read the next verse to you. By the 23rd year of King Joash, the priests still have not repaired the temple. What? What were they doing? What were they doing with that money? You know, they were probably busy helping people offer sacrifices and doing other kinds of priestly things. But the priests were not repairing the temple. And so the termite eating things and the, and the other things, you know, maybe they were folding down some. And God's house was not being fixed up to his glory. And so Joash came up with another plan. Now he's 30, 30 years old. And he got a big chest. Do you remember the story? Did you read that in Bible stories? He got a big chest and he drilled a hole in the top and he put it by the, the altar so that when people came to bring their sacrifices, they, they would bring money and they'd put it in there. And when the chest got full, he would take the money out and he would give it to the people who were repairing the temple. And the temple got repaired. Did you know we have a chest in our church? It's not one you can see, but it's called the Church Maintenance Fund. Is that right, Rob? Is that what we call it? Capital, Capital Building Fund. All right. So, folks, the chest is called the Capital Building Fund. We need you to donate to that. Because we got a lot of repairs around here to do. We don't want 30 years to go by, or 23 years, or what it is, before uh, everything's taken care of. Now, I know a lot of work's been done. We thank those that have been involved in it, but there's still a lot to do. So, here's, here's something I want to invite everyone in our church who can to do. I'd like to invite you to take a personal interest in the upkeep of your church. If you attend services here, this is your house. This is God's house. If you have a ministry area that you're in charge of, make sure it's always neat and tidy when you leave. If you have a Sabbath school room or a kitchen or whatever it is, make sure it's clean when you leave. If you have a ministry assignment like deacon or deaconess, the care of God's house is especially your duty. If you help in those areas, ask your leaders what you can do. Could I ask this? Devote some time, at least monthly, to helping care for the church outside of Sabbath hours. Folks, this is your house. This is God's house. It needs your help. If you don't know what to do, ask Carl. Ask Pastor Brownfield. We have lists. Let's fix up our church to the glory of God. Everyone, if you can, volunteer sometime. We have church work these come out when we have them. You know, sometimes we have the attitude, oh, it's good enough. Sometimes as we get older, you know, we, we don't have the energy anymore. Oh, we'll get around to it tomorrow. It's okay. It's not going to fall down tomorrow, if you can say. But friends, it's God's church. And his church and school should reflect the character of God. I am really happy. I was down at Kalama Iki School. They're doing some major kind of repairs and upgrades right now. Really thankful. New, new uh, libraries going in. New flooring in the library. New flooring in the, in the offices. It's looking good. Oh, I want to thank those of you who have a, okay, the bell went off, it's 12 o'clock, we, we can go, you know, up to 12, 15, I'm not going to go that long, but we can't. I don't know where the bell was, but anyway. All right, so some important things now. I want to say thank you to those in our church who have a heart for beautifying God's house. I want to say thank you to Hugh Wynn, who several years ago 
found that beautiful painting of the Lord's Supper in the back room of the church and said, this would be beautiful in the lobby and brought it out and arranged it. Friends, that, that kind of thing brings glory to God and brings people to Jesus when they, when they see the beauty of God's house. Again, I want to say thank you to Carl and his team. Do you realize how much has been done in the last year and a half? Not because of the year, but because of the faithfulness of these people. The stained glass windows have been repaired and repainted. A ground termite system has been installed. A rain gutters have been installed on the, on the, uh, the Issei side. They, they were falling off. They were rusty. The mayor could see them from his house. By the way, I met the mayor this week as I was coming back from exercise. He's a friendly guy. He says, let's talk story after the election. <laughs> Pray for your leaders. I want to thank Thomas for the painting he's doing. There's a lot of painting that needs to be done around here. And he's working. It's been painted underneath the Issei site. Church order and organization. But point number two. Three points. I'm going to go quickly through the second two. Church order and organization. When Jesus established the church, he appointed 12 men to serve as apostles. He taught them everything and asked them to continue to build his church after he left. After he left. Later, after Jesus ascended to heaven, he asked the, through the Holy Spirit, he had the deacons, uh, I'm sorry, the, the apostles appoint deacons. And as the church continued to grow and expand, more ministries were added. When the Seventh-day Adventist church first began, there were many who were against organization. <coughs> they were against getting organized and being recognized as a church. Ellen White wrote, wrote this. Our numbers gradually increased. God blessed. The church grew. It was evident that without some form of organization, there would be great confusion. The work would not be carried forward successfully. To provide for the support of the ministry, for the carrying of the work in the new fields, for protecting both the churches and the ministry from unworthy members, for holding church property, for the publication of the truth for the press, and for many other objects, organization was indispensable. But many were still against this. Oh, let's just let the Holy Spirit be. We sought the Lord with earnest prayer that we might understand His will. And light was given by the Holy Spirit that there must be order and thorough discipline in the church, that organization was essential. System and order are manifest in all the works of God through the universe. Order is the law of heaven, and it should be the law of God's people on the earth. So the Seventh-day Adventist Church was organized. And today it is very organized from top to bottom. Very organized. Some people say it's too organized. But a lot of people with better minds than mine and maybe yours have worked on this. And it's a good thing as long as we keep Jesus in front of us and depend on the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Speaking of organization, the Seventh-day Adventist Church has a wonderful plan for involving you all in ministry. It's called the Church Nominating Committee. That's a committee of your peers who takes a look at your spiritual gifts and helps you find your area of ministry in the church. Those who are members of, of the church. Um, nominating committee is going to be chosen next Sabbath. Next Sabbath, we're going to ask you to tell on each other about what spiritual gifts you see in the other person who you're married to, or who is your mother or father, or who is your child or your grandpa. We're going to have to, you get together in friend groups, family groups, and tell on each other. Because we don't think you'd probably tell on yourselves all the time. The Adventist Church policies and guidelines have been established to keep the church organized and functioning smoothly 
and to prevent problems of all kinds. People with far more experience than us have put them together. And mature people have a sense of respect for this process. Sometimes we get frustrated and restless with some of it, but we believe that God has guided us and is guiding us and that there is wisdom in the whole church working together under the leading of the Holy Spirit. And so the church has published something that's dry and most of you don't even read it. It's called the Seventh-day Adventist Church Manual. I just gave one to all the, all the elders because it gives processes and plans that have been tested over time for keeping the church organized. Lastly, God wants order, I believe, in our church doctrine and discipline. Church doctrine and discipline. By discipline, I mean the whole range of discipleship practices of the church. Bringing people to Jesus, helping them grow in their relationship with Him, helping them when they get in trouble, and figuring out how to work with those who seriously get in trouble. All of those things from beginning to end. The same care we exercise in our personal and church lives needs to be followed when it comes to church order in the areas of discipleship and doctrine. The word doctrine simply means teaching. The Bible contains the teachings or doctrines of Jesus, and these teachings clearly explain the truth about God and the way of salvation. Doctrine, now follow me folks, it'd be easy to fall asleep at this point, don't. Doctrine is vital because it describes the truth about God. And only the truth that comes from God will lead us to God and help us have a relationship with Him. Paul wrote something to Timothy. He said, I'm writing you these instructions so that if I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's house, <clears throat> which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the foundation of the truth. Now, what did Paul mean by that? Churches back in Bible times were constructed of a foundation, pillars, and a roof. And Paul says that the church of the living God is the pillar and the foundation of the truth. In other words, the truth is what makes up the roof and the house that we live in. So doctrine teachings of work. By the way, that term doctrine fell into kind of disrepute, dislike in the 1960s when the non-denominational church movement happened and people began to say, we're about Jesus, we're not about doctrine. And they begin to look down on doctrine and say, oh, we love Jesus, but not doctrine. It's because churches were fighting with each other over beliefs. But friends, where would Jesus be if there were no teaching about Jesus? Where would Jesus be if Jesus did not teach? We know Jesus through his teachings, through, through the doctrines of Scripture. We know Jesus. Jesus taught his disciples in the crowd. The disciples taught the new believers on the day of Pentecost. The Adventist Church take, takes teaching seriously. And so we have Sabbath school classes. And every seven years, our Sabbath school quarterly cycles through all of our beliefs and practices as a Seventh-day Adventist Church. By the way, you should come to Sabbath school classes, and you should study them, and you should take them seriously, because it will inform you, and it will form your relationship with God. Your life will be revived if you come to Chiruro Fanani's Sabbath school class in the back in this little room, or Wayne and uh, Stephen's class back there, or Dennis's class, other classes. Come to Sabbath school class and study. Okay, quickly. Here's what Paul says about doctrine. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them. Because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. What you have heard from me keep with a pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Yeah, don't just, don't just get all doctrinal but make sure it's mixed with faith and love in Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you 
guarded with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Now, this, this one's a little long, but it's important. Do your best to present, present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, and who correctly handles the word of truth. We can mishandle the word of truth. We can interpret incorrectly. We can have wrong assumptions when we come to it. Then he goes on, avoid godless chatter, because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. You know what gangrene is? It's deadly. Among them was Hymenaeus and Philetus. He names names, Paul does. Who have wandered away from the truth. They say that the resurrection has already taken place and they've destroyed the faith of some. So here are these two people, Hymenaeus and Philetus, who said, oh, the resurrection's already happened. They were confusing people about scripture. And Paul said, it's like gay green. Be careful. Be aware. Study your Bibles. The Bible gives strong teaching about paying our attention to our doctrines. The Seventh-day Adventist Church is a movement based on the teachings of the Bible. Early Adventists who have followed uh, in their spirit and those who have followed in their spirit have studied the Bible carefully to understand the truths of Scripture in relationship to Jesus and the plan of salvation. And those who become members in the Seventh-day Adventist Church go through a Bible study process. And we study what the Bible says. And as they learn that, then they make a decision if they want to become Seventh-day Adventists because to be Seventh-day Adventists means that we believe some things. And we stand on those things. And we preach those things. When we church, church, choose church leaders, transfer membership, we do it carefully. Members have a right to know that leaders are Adventists in faith and practice and in good and regular standing. Now, conclusion. When we realize how far short we fall in what we do, the message of the gospel comforts us. What is the message of the gospel? It says that Jesus came here to this world to live a life of perfect obedience on our behalf. So his righteousness could be credited to us when we admit our shortcomings and sins and trust in him. Jesus trusted his father every day and so he lived a life of perfect order in obedience. Not only did he never sin, but his life was always in the center of God's will. When we look at our own lives and realize that we have not done this, however, and when we put our faith in Jesus, he credits his perfect orderliness and obedience and organization and life plan to our lives. And we stand at that point in front of God as if we never sinned accepted as sons and daughters of God. No matter how we've sinned, no matter what we've done, no matter what our failings, God accepts us as perfect before the universe. And beyond that, we die for our sins so that he can forgive all of our faults and we can be accepted in heaven. Folks, as I look at my life, as I look back, I see a lot of failure. I see a lot of sin. I see a lot of feeling like I haven't succeeded in ways that I wanted to. But I believe in a Savior who lived a perfect, organized, obedient life, who has credited his life to me. And so I stand before him perfectly as a son of God.